Um, in your book, The China Study, chapter 13, um, you, the title was called Science, the Dark Side. What did you mean by that? Well, first off, let me say I've enjoyed a career in science, and I love science. I love the, the basic uh, customs and, and uh, rules and regulations, if, you, if I can call them that, the practices. Um, I just like the concept of science because for me, it, if we do it right, uh, do it as well as we can, it really is a, it's a force that just drives toward being honest, for one thing, being objective, just one force in oneself to, to live that way. Uh, so I, I think of science in a classical sense as being a really delightful sort of discipline to work in. I enjoyed it a great deal. But what I have seen, unfortunately, over the years, particularly having been involved in policy activities for some pretty intensively for about 20 years, um, I've just come to realize, unfortunately, uh, that we confuse the word science with technology. The, pu the public tend to think of scientific evidence in a sort of a, uh, a singular way. It's either evidence or it's not evidence. When in fact, uh, what I find is that uh, so much of the thing that we call uh, evidence, scientific evidence, particularly in the media and so forth, um, really is, uh, is, a, a technolo is technology in a sense. People are doing work to prove a certain point which in, in many ways doesn't exactly square with what science is all about. Uh, science, to me, is the art of observation. You see something. You see something possibly interesting. And so there, at that point, you know, if you're really into research, you sort of start asking some questions and always being prepared to get either one answer or the other answer, being prepared to be wrong and admit it, being prepared to uh, offer your findings to others to criticize, I mean, I like that whole engagement of uh, the back and forth and, and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, especially having been in the policy community for pretty intensively for quite some years, um, I see the corporate sector. I see the hand of the corporate sector become an ever so strong, so strong. And so in that particular case, uh, people, for whatever reason, consciously or unconsciously, paid or unpaid, uh, tend to uh, really want to prove a point, want to prove a point. And so too often those points being proved, if, if you will, are, are very specific items of information. They're missing the big story. And uh, I, I find just, for example, the conversation we've been just having here uh, tonight, to some extent, uh, is really very, very you know, nice conversation on the one hand, but I think we, we have to worry a little bit about getting caught in the weeds, getting caught in the weeds, talking about, you know, specifically saturated fat, for example. Uh, saturated fat is, is the, the bad guy in the, in the block, has been for a long time, supposedly. Unsaturated fat for plants is, the, is a good thing. But in reality, the saturated fat story, I think, has been vastly overdone. It's one, just I'm using it as an example. Uh, we're just putting our finger on saturated fat or cholesterol, whatever. Over 100 years ago, it was shown in the laboratory that saturated fat was not the key determinant of the level of cholesterol in the blood, for example. It was animal protein. It was animal protein. And that research started in 1909 with an observation by a Russian fellow, but then continued for the next uh, 15 years, I think it was, several research groups looking at that question. Finally, in 1923 and again in 26, uh, there came a, a sort of a, a, a statement from the group at the University of Michigan claiming there's been beyond proof, essentially, I mean, he said it very strongly, that group said it very strongly, saturated fat was not the cause of high cholesterol levels. Consuming saturated fat, it really was protein, which animal protein in particular. Uh, that, in turn, energized me to some extent because uh, then one starts to ask questions, well, how does, that, how does protein really work? You know, we're looking at some mechanisms and so forth. How does it intervene in the synthesis of cholesterol and that kind of thing? And you, pretty soon you start getting lost in the weeds. And then all of a sudden we realize that, that the animal protein, at least seen in epidemiological studies, is an indication of a much larger change in our dietary scope. So when we start thinking then about the right relationship between diet and, and disease, heart disease, cancer, and so forth and so on, um, the, just the mere notion, just the mere notion for people to say, I want to eat animal protein, I need it. 
which means in turn, you know, eating animal-based foods, which then distorts the diet. So it, it sort of, for me at least, it stretches my thought pattern into a much larger scope and try, try to put my hands on something that I can say, but really has breadth to it. It really has breadth to it. And so um, that's coming back to the scientific question again. I, I, um, I just find too much of the science that's being done in our institutions, in our academic institutions in particular, being um, compromised by the influence of the corporate sector. And I think it's getting worse. Thank you.